So this is called action in life and art. And what I really want to try and um, persuade you of is that um, something that initially sounds quite technical and formal, um, so a kind of distinction from the philosophy of action, and we'll look at different ways of making this distinction, but there's a kind of general distinction available. And I'm going to try and suggest that um, this distinction is, is very, very important um, to things related to value, which is why I've also got aesthetics there, um, to ethics, but also to how we conceive of um, our lives more, more generally. So th um, this is going to be the idea, and you know, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. Now, often when people try and relate philosophy of action um, to ethics especially, and maybe things related to value more generally, it tends to be things like responsibility, free will, agency, um, and so on. I will at some point say something about um, certainly praise and blame, but this is not that project. So part of what I want to try and persuade you of is that there are other questions um, in ethics and aesthetics, not just the usual agency um, free will questions, which philosophy of action can address. And the idea behind this, I suppose, is that there are debates in um, what's sometimes called normative ethics or ethical theory, applied ethics, um, even meta-ethics, um, where action can help. Whereas normally what happens is we have this thing called moral psychology, um, thought of as an, a branch of maybe ethical theory. Um, and that's really concerned with questions of intention, volition, um, emotion, and so on. So sometimes when, when you mention these things, people say, oh, you're interested in moral psychology. That's what you're doing. And so I'm going to try and persuade you that we can talk of these things in relation to action when we're doing other things. And I'll start with this distinction I mentioned. I'll move on to questions um, in ethics. And I'll end with life and art. So I'm going to kind of build up to it and see how far I can persuade you. Um, OK, and so we're now in section one. This is called ambiguity in action. And this is the, the formal thing I was talking about. There are um, many distinctions one can make in relation to action. and different ways of carving things up. So we could talk about the word action or the concept of action or different conceptions of action. And in each case, um, we can make several distinctions. I'm not going to bore you with huge lists of distinctions. Um, I have done that to people before, and it didn't go very well. So I'm, I'm going to stick to, to one distinction. And later, I'll come back to how to understand this, because people who seem to be making the same distinction um, say very, very different things about how to understand it. And these will, will be crucial, but I, I want to initially just throw it out and remain neutral on how to understand it. And I'll give you a few versions of this. And I'm starting with um, John McMurray. This is the first quotation on the handout. Um, and the idea here is that action is not particularly special in this regard. Um, so the distinction can also be made, he says, in relation to perception and conception. Um, we'll later see Paul Ricoeur making it in relation to speech. And I think it can be made in relation to other things like belief and so on. Um, and I'll just read this out and then talk a bit about it. So he, McMurray says, the term action is involved in the same ambiguity as terms like perception or conception. It may refer either to what is done or to the doing of it, either doing or deed. When we talk of an action, we are normally referring to what is done. So it ends with a claim about maybe ordinary language. We can leave that aside for now, um, though it may be important. The, but the idea is no matter how we ordinarily use these terms, um, we can distinguish between um, the doing of something and the thing you do. And this is sometimes called a process product distinction. I think this is maybe misleading. Um, but the analogies with perception and conception are meant to be um, there's the thing I perceive maybe the glass of water, and my perceiving it. And there's the thing I conceive, or the thing I think or believe, and my thinking it. So whatever you think thinking is, maybe a mental process of some kind, there's the thinking and the thing thought, the seeing and the thing seen. Um, and he's suggesting there's the doing and the thing done. Um, so um, when we act, there's um, 
an act of doing. Some people think this is an event. This is one of the debates I was talking about, how to fill these things in. So you may think there's the event of my doing something and the thing that I do. OK. Um, Jennifer Hornsby, who I think spoke here last week, um, says something similar. So again, the notion of ambiguity. Um, and she talks of things people do very often considered to be events. Uh, I'm sorry, things people do versus people's doing these things. And the latter are very often considered to be events. OK. And now there are these analogies, but you may also think there are disanalogies because the thing seen, depending on your theories of perception or the thing heard or whatever, you may think the thing seen is a kind of physical object or something, whereas the thing done doesn't seem to be an entity in this sense. Um, Paul Ricoeur, and this is the final quotation in section one of the handout, talks of the saying and the thing said. All right? So I may say, um, hi, everyone, and then there can be my act of saying this thing. And, and we may, they, these may have very different properties, right? I, um, if I say it loudly, then maybe my act is one of saying it loudly. Um, maybe you and I can say the same thing. So you can say, hi, everyone. I can say, hi, everyone. So we say the same thing, but there's your saying it and my saying it. And of course, um, speech is a particularly interesting case because um, to say something is to act anyway. So then we can say there's your doing this thing and, and the thing you do. But the thing you do is not the thing you say. What you do is say this thing, something like that. OK, so this is the kind of general distinction. And there are going to be debates about the nature of the things on each side of this distinction. So what are doings? Are they events? Are they processes? Are they um, instances of relations? Um, what are these things? People tend to think um, they're particular, i.e. that every time I do the same thing, there's a different doing. Um, and they tend to think that they're located in time and space. So we can say, when did this action occur? Something like that. There are problems with these questions, but that's a kind of general um, agreement there. And then there'll be disagreement about the metaphysics of these things. Things done, again, there'll be disagreement here, but they seem more universal, less particular, not obviously located anywhere, um, and they seem repeatable. So there's a sense of thing done, at least, where you might tell someone, stop doing that again and again and again, right? Um, each time there's a different act of doing, but um, you keep doing the same thing, or you keep making the same mistake. This may be true in during this talk. OK. So this distinction is um, prevalent in philosophy of action. Not everybody likes it, um, and there are different ways of understanding it. One thing I'm interested in is why, when we turn to ethical theories of right action, so theories either about what makes an action right or maybe um, what it is for an action to be right. These may be done in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. So you may have people who think, take utilitarianism, an act is right if it, or if and only if, it maximizes pleasure in some sense, something like that. So these are accounts of, of right action. Um, in Kant, you may think an act is right if done, um, only if done from the motive of duty, um, and so on and so forth. An act is right if it fulfills, if it's in accordance with or follows these commandments and not those, or something like that. And an act is wrong if it breaks one of these rules. So these are theories of, of right action, and a lot of ethical theories concerned with that. Interestingly, it's very rare when you look at um, and read this stuff for anyone to say, oh, in what sense of action? What are we talking about here? And if you read um, people like Mill and Kant, and I'll give some examples later, um, they seem to switch between talk of doings and talk of things done um, as if nothing has happened. OK, now this switch um, may be innocuous, because it could be that I've got this technical distinction, and in ordinary language, it's not fully um, mirrored. Um, and I think 
this is to some degree true. So even though um, both Hornsby and McMurray talk of, when we ordinarily talk of action, it's like this, or when it has a plural, it's typically like that. Um, there's not a neat fit between this distinction I've made and how we ordinarily use words. Language is far messier than that. But that doesn't mean that there aren't these two um, very important um, concepts of action, and they're different. And it, it seems to me there's, a, there's going to be a difference between what it is for um, a thing one does to be right or wrong. These are sometimes called act types, um, where you might think killing is wrong, or murder is wrong, or lying is wrong. These are things we might all do. Um, versus um, your lying to this person on Monday morning was wrong. So the one is the kind of type, and the other is, is the, the more particular. Um, and what I'm going to try and persuade you is that there's a huge difference between claims evaluating a person's doing something and claims about the rightness or wrongness of the thing done. Um, to anticipate the view I'm going to be working towards says that even though I'm starting with kind of theories of um, action, of right action in moral philosophy, this view is going to hold much wider um, for life itself. And I'll just give you one kind of example from now. Um, not a very happy example, maybe. But think of when you read um, obituaries. So when you read an obituary, what you tend to get is a list of usually achievements, maybe sometimes failures as well. Um, maybe if you get the obituary of some horrid dictator, it's not full of praise. But what is, tends to be listed is, what did this person do? They did this, then they went on to do that, then they did this. Um, and these are things that are in some ways repeatable. You might think, oh, could I have done that? Do I lack the abilities to do that? Um, what a great person to have done that. What a horrid person to have done that. But they tend to be things that we can conceive of other people doing. Um, maybe you might think, well, I couldn't do that because I don't have those piano skills or something. But you might imagine someone else might be able to do it. Um, what you don't get necessarily is anything about their acts of doing these things. And I, I think there's something very, very important when we're trying to understand people, but also evaluate them, and indeed praise or blame them. This is the bit that's going to come a bit nearer to responsibility later, that we miss out if all we've got is these lists of um, successes or failures and so on. Um, and I'll give you just one example from now, and I may try others later, so this may or may not work for you. So suppose James and I both give the same percentage of our salary to the same charity. So James says, I gave 20% of my salary to Oxfam, and he's not lying. And I say, so did I, and I'm not lying. And so we both, there's a sense in which we both do the same thing. You know, and James may stand up and say, you should do it too, or something like that. Um, but now suppose when James does it, his doing it is his genuinely trying to help people um, in need. And my doing it was showing off, showing off in, in front of someone while, while I was doing it. So I was, you know putting in my details, and what I was doing was giving money to charity. That's one thing I was doing. But another thing I was doing was showing off. Um, and so then when, this is getting a bit morbid, maybe not our obituaries, but when, when we're up for Oscars, and they list our achievements, um, and you know, you're told, oh, and they both did this, you may think, oh, how nice. But in fact, these are two very, very different actions, right? James's is very virtuous, mine less so. Okay, um, and that's the bit that I think is, is, is missing um, from the way we th often think about lives and, and also missing often from normative um, theories, so theories about right action. And um, I'm going to speed through the next two sections and then slow down again. So get, moving on to section two, this is just there 
to say that I'm not making this stuff up. And these are kind of random examples, mainly chosen for their brevity. So I was looking for cases where I, I, I won't bore you with more than one sentence. Um, so th this is Jesse Prince. An action has the property of being morally right or wrong in case it causes feelings of approbation and so on and so forth. I'm not interested in the theory here, but in the, in the thought that he, this is a theory of rightness or wrongness of an action. And we're not told what an action is anywhere in this book, but it seems to be something that can cause feelings of approbation. So that you might hear want to ask yourself, is that more like a doing or more like a thing done? That's one kind of question. Um, in Pritchard, an obligation is always an obligation to do some action. And Jonathan Bennett, and um, this is my favorite of these examples, when we say that what he did was wrong, we mean that he acted wrongly. And this is really my kind of target view here, um, because it could be that what I do is in a sense right. It's gift 20% of my ch money to this charity, but I'm not acting rightly if my sole motive is showing off or some other vicious motive. Um, so it's this, what I'm interested in is this move from he did the right thing, the thing that according to your favorite moral theory um, is the right thing to do, whether you are interested in consequences or other things, and acting rightly. Now sometimes when people say things that sound like what I've just said, the response is, oh, you're a virtue ethicist. You're interested in intention and so on, virtue. That's fine, this is one position among many. Um, but in fact, um, certainly contemporary virtue ethicists, most of them make the same mistake I've been accusing um, everyone, in a sense, of, of making, everyone in normative theory. And this is that um, they say, no, no, intention matters to what makes an action right. And our theory is in competition with other views in ethics. And you, which action should you perform? The one the virtuous agent would perform, or something like that. Um, so what we end up getting, and this is section three, I've got an anti-virtue ethicist, at least in this moment in time, this is Martha Nussbaum. There are places where she's more friendly to virtue ethics. And a virtue ethicist, this is Christine Swanton. And what we're getting is, um, if you look at the Nussbaum, she's talking about Iris Murdoch. And she says she's so preoccupied with the inner world that she, it's, and it's like she doesn't care about the difference an actual action can make. And if you look at the last bit in bold, no matter whether the agent's intentions are pure. So this kind of move is like, look, Sandis gave 20% of his money. Why are you so obsessed about why he did it and whether he was showing off? He made a difference in the world. That's what matters. And it's almost kind of um, obsessive or narcissistic to... to be interested in one's own motives for doing things. What matters is the things you do. Um, Swanton, on the other hand, um, is interested in, um, so she's talking of the Nussbaum view on, at, at the start here, rightness, it may be claimed, has nothing to do with an agent's motives or reasons, but has exactly to do with success, with what is actually done. Did you give the money or not? Did you help the stranger? Um, and she doesn't like this view because she says you can mimic. So my act is mimicking James's virtuous act. Um, um, but in the hands of the actor, this could be unvirtuous, uncaring, or racist, or whatever. So it could be that we do the same thing, so I'm mimicking what the virtuous agent does, but in my hands, the action is. Um, now, this is a move I like, but what we don't have is the notion that um, you're doing the right thing, but your doing of it is wrong. What's going on here is she's saying, in that case, you've not done the right thing. So they're still in, in the same debate. Okay. Brief venture into metaphysics. I promise you it will be brief. Uh, metaphysics of action. This is about how to understand the nature of the, this distinction I've been going on about. And one way of doing it, which is sometimes um, attributed to Anscombe, but can be found in Ross, who she's oddly arguing against sometimes when she's doing this stuff, 
is that you can, and it was later found in Davidson, Donald Davidson, is that one act can have more than one description. Okay, so um, my um, lifting my hand can be my lifting the glass or something like that. Um, my performing this movement can be waving to somebody. And indeed, my giving to charity can be my showing off. So you might think there's one action here um, with two descriptions. Um, but if you don't distinguish between the doing and the thing done, then what you end up saying is that, that not only are there two descriptions of my doing this thing, but that there's one thing I do with numerous descriptions. And this is what we're getting in Ross and Anscombe. Um, and you can, you can see in the Ross here, this is under four, what I do is describable as packing. And in Anscombe, we, we move from descriptions of doing to something done. So what's intentional is not the doing. Well, it is the doing, but it's also the thing done. And to talk of events. So somehow, there's no distinction between what I do, the event of my doing it, um, and so on. Because that distinction just isn't playing a role in this work. And I think bad, ha bad things happen when you don't make this distinction. Um, so I think redescription is, is all well and good, but it won't get us out of, of this problem. Um, I think far more plausible is the view that um, in many cases, not in all cases, um, redescriptions give rise to new things done. So um, James and I both give money to charity, but I also do something additional, which is showing off and James maybe does other additional things that I don't do. Um, but there's only one doing, right? There's only one acting. Okay, um, now so one way of resisting this is to do more heavy metaphysics. And this is um, Matthew Hanser, this is the last quotation on the first side of your handout. And this is the idea that there are these things called act types and then, um, and these are the things we do, and then there are these tokens or instances of these things, um, and these are the particular rather than universal um, doings. Um, this is what the last quotation on this handout says. Um, I find this a deeply implausible view. I probably won't be able to persuade you in a couple of sentences, um, but for one, um, when I do something, I don't do a type I mean, I might do a type of thing, but I, the thing I do falls under a type. Um, so there might be the type that's killing, and then what I do is say, kill X. I'm talking as if I kind of do this every day. Um, but what I do isn't a type. Um, it's something that falls um, under a type. Second side. One way of, of resisting this kind of Hanser move is to, in effect, deny that there's a serious distinction. Um, so this is Jonathan Dancy, who's um, speaking here next week, I believe. And um, he's saying there should be less action in our moral metaphysics, not more. So he's saying stop these adding more entities um, we, we're fine with the concepts we have. We don't need more than one concept of action. Let's have less. Um, so how do we do that? He's, um, he says, he did the right thing for the wrong reason. So I gave money to charity in order to show off. Means something like he acted rightly, but for the wrong reasons. Um, he veed, and in the situation, he was right to v. So maybe I was... The right thing to do was to give money to this charity, but the reasons why he veed were not the reasons why he was right to be. Why did I vee in order to show off? Why should I have given the money to charity to help these people? Right? So I kind of I do the right thing, but for the wrong reason. And so the reasons, my reasons for acting and the reasons that make the action right have gone wrong. And on Dancy's view, um, we can tell this story with one notion of action, and we just bring in the reasons. Um, but I think there's a deep problem with this view, and you can find it in this very line, he acted rightly, but for the wrong reasons. I'm not acting rightly when I'm showing off. I'm acting very, very wrongly. It's almost an accident that I do the right thing in this other sense of what I do. 
but I'm not acting rightly, I'm not acting virtuously. Um, this point is kind of made by Rosalind Hershaus, which is the last quotation here in section four. Um, and she says that what's misleading about the phrase doing the right thing for the wrong reason, um, or indeed the wrong thing for the right reason, but she's got the first in mind, um, what's misleading is that it obscures the fact that in one way, the agent is not doing the right thing. What she's doing is, say, try to impress the onlookers, hurt someone's feelings, um, and so on. But notice again that when she makes them this move, and I think it's a, generally a good move against the kind of position Dancy holds, when she makes it, she doesn't make it by saying, um, look, what she does is right, and her doing of it is wrong. So she's acting wrongly, but she's doing the right thing. Um, because she hasn't got that distinction. So what happens again is we end up saying, no, no, what she's doing is wrong. Um, and of course, one of the things she's doing is wrong. But, but in, in the Hurstas example, the idea that she's done anything right has completely disappeared now. Um, and that seems wrong if, if the things we do are, are repeatables. Um, because that's almost suggesting James and I aren't even doing the same thing at all. And there's just a very ordinary sense in which this has to be wrong. We, we're both doing the, the same thing. It's just you're acting rightly um, and I'm not. Um, and this brings us to moral appraisal. Because you may want to praise one of us and blame another, even though we've done the same thing. And again, um, if you look at the literature on moral appraisal, I think it, it, it lacks something. And I think this distinction I started can help um, fill, fill that gap. This is Thomas Nagel. We judge people for what they actually do or fail to do. A person can be morally responsible only for what he does. That's again this idea, you know, you take an obituary, you see what the person did, and you judge them. No talk of the doing which may re reveal the intentions, the reasons, the motives and so on. That's just not, we don't judge people for anything else. Seems qu quite an extreme view. Um, going a little bit back in the history of philosophy, so this is Kant. Um, he's kind of interested in saying, look, um, you can do the thing that you ought to do, but your action may lack moral worth if you do it with the wrong kind of motive. Um, and in this passage, what he has in mind is, um, um, suppose we, um, we knew that heaven and hell existed, God existed, and suppose we knew these things. Then, he thinks, um, most, maybe all of us, would do all the right things. But we do them um, with very bad motives. We would do them in fear of ending up in hell or in order to enjoy the pleasures of heaven, or whatever. So he says, most lawful actions, and he means morally lawful, not, not the kind of um, laws of a state, would be done from fear, maybe a few from hope, and none at all from duty. And the moral worth of actions, on which alone, after all, the worth of a person, and even that of the world, hinges in the eyes of the highest wisdom, would not exist at all. So actions would have no moral worth. Right, so this is, in some ways, this is a complete contrast to the Nagel. The only thing that matters is what you do, and now we're getting the only thing that matters is the motive from which you do this thing. Big, big clash, even though they're both spoken of as being um, kind of deontologists in some sense. Um, but what's the clash about? Um, I think the clash is occurring because there's no doing thing done distinction. So if you what you're interested in is the moral worth of an act, the one that reveals whether your motive was duty or fear or hope. What you're evaluating is the doing. Um, and this is why we, we end up with almost a paradox in Kant. You do the right thing, but it's morally worthless. Um, Ross, following in Kant, um, takes this view and turns it into something that's completely paradoxical. This is the first line of the next quotation. Nothing that ought to be done is ever morally good. You read this, you kind of think, what on earth? 
is this. What's go what's, uh, so this is me trying to tell you something's gone deeply wrong here. Um, one way of talking about these concepts is to say we have deontic concepts. These are the concepts to do with duty, from the Greek word deon, obligation, duty. Um, and then we have evaluative concepts. Um, and these have to do with evaluation. And the duty ones are rightness, wrongness, and the evaluative ones are goodness, badness. Um, this is all well and good. We're, no pun intended, we can, we can talk about the rightness, we can talk about the goodness. Um, but once you've, once you've only got one thing called action to which you're ascribing all these properties to, you end up saying not just that something might be the right thing to do but not good, but that nothing that ought to be done is ever morally good. And this, this just um, can't be right. And he carries on. What is morally good is never right. You think, how, how, this can't, how can that possibly be true? Um, how can a morally good action never be a right action? Um, now, what, what I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to say motives belong in the realm of goodness and badness, and action belongs in the world of rightness and wrongness. And so we have two different things, but they're not two notions of action. We can, we, evaluative concepts apply to motives, reasons, intentions. Deontic concepts like rightness and wrongness apply to action. Um, is this true? Um, well, we talk of right and wrong reasons. Um, we talk of good and bad actions. Um, we'd need to do a, a lot more further work to understand what exactly um, is going on here. Um, I'm going to skip, skip the next quotation, um, which is adding a further layer of complexity, but I think just digging um, deeper, um, and come to an analogy now. So when I began this talk, I, be I said one different, one analogy to the doing thing done distinction is the believing thing believed distinction, right? So there's what I believe and my believing it. Um, and it could be, suppose that I believe something that's true, but I believe it um, for very bad reasons. You might want to criticize my believing this thing, but not the thing I believe. Right? You, may, you may think there's nothing wrong with what he believes, but if you ask him why he believes it, dear God. Right? Um, and you could get it the other way around. There may be cases where um, it's tempting to say, I'm justified in having this belief, even if the belief is completely false. So you may think the belief is no good. But um, yeah, I understand why he's believing this. And in the circumstances, that was the right thing to believe. But there, what we're talking about is the believing that's right, not the thing believed. Um, now, um, there was a debate in, in the 60s when um, a guy called Gettier published this now very, very famous paper, um, Is Knowledge Justified True Belief? The idea was that we can come up with examples. Um, so he thought, rightly or wrongly, that many philosophers um, from Plato onwards claim that knowledge, to know something is to have a belief that's not only true, um, but justified. And Gettier came up with various, um, sometimes quite complicated, uh, counterexamples to this view. So there'd be examples where um, I had a justified belief, and it was also true but it didn't count as knowledge. Um, and in fact, the simplest example comes not from Gettier, but from Russell, and, who, and in fact, it's, it predates Gettier. Um, and this is of a case, we don't have a clock here. Imagine there's, there's a clock um, in this room, and um, there's no good reason to doubt that it's in functioning um, order. So we, there's no evidence that um, I've been checking it all morning maybe even neurotically. Every two minutes I check the clock, it's, it's functioning perfectly fine. Um, so I'm justified to um, believe that th the right time is whatever time this clock says. As it happens, the clock stops just as I'm about to check it, or rather stops an hour before I check it or something. Um, this is not gonna work. Um, <laughs> it stops at some point and even a broken clock tells the right time of day, the right time twice a day. 
Um, so even though now the clock is broken and shouldn't be trusted, um, I'm justified in trusting it. There's no reason to mistrust it. And I happen to look at it when it's telling the exact right time of day. So I have a justified true belief, but it's not knowledge. And when these examples came up, I can, you know, maybe some of you are thinking, is that knowledge? Is it not knowledge? You know, um, when, when Getya um, did this, um, some people were completely on board with the examples, and other people thought, these beliefs aren't justified. He's, you're not, ju how can you be justified? The clock is broken. You're not justified to believe this. Um, it turned out that what was going on was that um, there were two senses, at least two, I think there were actually three, but let's stick with two, um, of justification here, or rather two objects of justification. And um, I'm going to quote Clayton Littlejohn, who, who says this very nicely. Ascriptions of personal justification tell us something about a believer, whether she is justified in believing. An ascription of doxastic justification tells us something about a belief, whether the belief is, he says, justifiably held. Um, you might have said justified. So the idea here is that, of course, people have contradicting intuitions about these cases because it's one thing for me to be justified to have a belief. It's another for the belief itself to be justified, whatever that might mean. So you may think, if the clock is broken, no belief about it is justified. But I'm justified in believing it's telling the right time because I have no good reason to think otherwise. Um, and you can get a version of this in ethics, Gilbert Harmon. I want to distinguish between using the word wrong to say that a particular situation or action is wrong from using the word to say that it is wrong of someone to do something. So this is the idea where you might say, um, what you did was right, but it was wrong of you to do it. What you believed was right, but it was wrong of you given the evidence to believe it. So the belief may have been true, but you had no grounds to believe it. Or maybe you had very good grounds for your belief, but the belief itself wasn't justified. If we were asked, if you were to ask, should one believe this thing? God, no. But nonetheless, this person, given their limited evidence, was justified to hold this belief. I think this is a, a, a very helpful analogous distinction, but it doesn't get us all the way again, because um, the problem, to go back to the charity example, um, it's not that it's wrong of me to give to the charity. It's not as if, sure, one should give to charity, but I shouldn't have done so. No, no, of course I should have done so. It's just that my doing it wasn't acting rightly. I should have done it for other reasons. So the problem isn't whether it's right or wrong of me to do this thing. It, it's, it's rather to do with, was I doing it rightly or wrongly? Okay, and now as promised, we get to um, first art and finally life. There used to be a famous school, um, mainly of painting, though um, you can apply it to other arts, called action painting. Um, Pollock is the most obvious kind of example, um, the most famous of the action painters. The term really comes from the art critic Harold Rosenberg, who kind of, in a sense, the critics often create the schools or give them names and theories while the other people are busy doing the, um, performing the art. And um, the idea, there were many ideas, but one of the central ideas behind action painting was that the, the thing you paint so I'm here thinking, think of the word painting as ambiguous between the verb painting, my painting, your painting, and the noun painting, the painting I painted. Right? So it's again like the doing thing done. We've got the painting and the thing painted, but the same word. And in action painting, there was the idea that the painting represents action, but it doesn't represent it in the way in which um, one might paint loads of people running and get the movements of the people running. It was nothing like that. Um, this was, after all, pretty abstract stuff, right? Think of the, the, the splurges and the um, sort of brush strokes. And, and, and what was going on there, according to action painting, was that 
you can see the stroking, you can see the, um, the brushing in the thing painted, right? That, that was the, um, the idea. Um, so Harold Rosenberg says things like, a canvas is an arena in which to act, a painting is an action that becomes its own representation. An act can be prolonged from a piece of paper to a canvas. And um, um, Mary McCarthy wittily replies, you can't hang an event on a wall, right? And you can't hang an action on a wall. What are you going on about? This is nonsense. And there is something nonsensical in, in um, saying things like a, a painting is an action. But I think what we can learn from, from this school is that there are two things we might evaluate when we're evaluating art. One is um, the painting verb, the act or process of painting. The other is, is the thing painted. These are two um, distinct things. And one reason why with people like Pollock, we have all these films of them painting, is that um, there's a way of conceiving of action painting where the artwork, it's a performance art, what later, you know, what we call performance art. The artwork is the painting verb. And the thing left is a kind of residue or souvenir of the act of painting. It's just, you just happen to end up, and of course these things now have great value, right? More than your maybe, you know, DVD of the act of painting. Um, but really, these are just what you end up with once the art is over, right? The art, you can see the art in the making when you watch these videos, and then you're left with kind of ashes of the art. It's literally what's left over. Um, and I think things done are kind of like the ashes of acts of doing. Okay, so when you're trying to evaluate a life, um, looking at these things done, lists of things done, um, is a bit like trying to evaluate um, Pollock action painting by looking at these things on the wall. That's not what you're meant to be doing. Um, also interesting, just like in, in ethics, there are these debates, does intention matter to whether an action is right or wrong, good or bad? There are these even more famous debates in aesthetics. Does intention matter to whether this is a good or bad painting? Should we care about the author's intention when we're trying to do literary criticism of a novel? Um, does biography matter? Does it matter um, whether the, um, lots of recent cases of this in England, unfortunately, whether the artist was a pedophile, for example? Um, does it matter whether um, the art is derivative in some sense. So you're painting something, but you've stolen the ideas from somewhere else. Whether it's a copy. There was a case not, not long ago, um, Eli Sakai managed to fool both Christie's and Sotheby's. And um, the only reason um, he was caught was that the very same, very same painting was on auction at the same time one in Sotheby's in London and one in Christie's in New York, experts had verified this, right? And so you may want to say, one of these is the better painting. It's the original, it's gotta be the better painting. Even though experts with microscopes couldn't tell the difference, they're somehow committed. Of course, one is more valuable from a monetary point of view, but put that aside. Um, the fact that an expert with a microscope can't tell the difference, why should we think one is a better painting? Of course, if what you're interested in is the act of painting, then you, then you, um, um, you may say um, that, I think it was a Matisse, you, you, you may say that, of course, Matisse's painting is, um, is far more valuable um, than um, the Sakai painting, um, whatever your views on forgeries. You may think, no, no, it's, the, the, forger, the act of forging is even more valuable because he had to find paints that were just like those, and you know, that is indeed. But at any rate, there's two different things we can be evaluating here, um, I think. And we often let our thoughts about the one affect our thoughts about the other. And I think this is a mistake. And it's a mistake in art, and it's a mistake in ethics, and it's a mistake in, in life in general. And I want to end with, so this is Nietzsche, I'm not asking you to believe anything Nietzsche said, um, but um, when Nietzsche talks about life as art, he's, he's talking about, um, let me give you the quotation, art is the real task of life. 
art as life's metaphysical activity. And what he does not mean here is that the real task of life is to create paintings and literature and so on. That may, well, that, that may be all well and good, but that's not what's going on here. It's that um, the task of life is creating a life, but there's this distinction between the thing created and the act of creating it, and the art is, is it's the activity, this is the, the word Nietzsche uses here, it's the metaphysical activity of creating your life, and that's what matters, not the life you happen to create. Um, but it's very easy to miss this point, so I lend with, I mean, this is one of my favorite philosophers, actually, but I think he's wrong about this, so this is Alexander Nehemas in his book on Nietzsche, um, Life as Art, everything we have done actually constitutes who each one of us is. And this is exactly the view I've tried to be to argue against. It's not what you do that constitutes you, but the activity of doing this thing, of living this life. Um, and that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>